as Rusty said, let's turn to 1 Peter. You know, I was, uh, it was kind of a busy summer, traveled quite a bit, and, you know, there's always a lot of things going on, and uh, at, at a certain point, all of a sudden, I remember, oh, yeah, the men's studies coming up here, and, you know, in uh, three or four weeks or something, and um, gosh, I wonder, you know, I wonder what I'll teach, and, you know, that, that thought passed through my mind a couple of times, and um, Dave, Dave Eason and I, one morning after prayer, we were talking, and I, I don't know, I think it was just the Lord, you know, Dave just kind of goes, hey, you should teach First and Second Peter, and I just thought, okay. Yeah, that's what we'll do. <laughs> but it just it just sounded like such a great idea. So I thought, you know, the Lord must be in that. And uh, these these two epistles of Peter, great, great uh, epistles, uh, you know, extremely relevant, um, especially to the times that we're living in. And I think that you guys are going to find um, a lot of encouragement here. That's what we're that's what we're praying for. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have brought us all back together here after a little season of uh, being off of the study. And now, Lord, as we've come back and are making a fresh commitment, we pray, Lord, that you would just do a lot of great things in our lives. And Lord, even tonight, as we start, we pray that your spirit would break through. We pray, Lord, that your love would melt us. We pray, Lord, that your grace would overwhelm us. And, Lord, we pray that we would just yield ourselves to you to become the men that you want us to be. And so, Lord, even tonight, I'm sure that uh, there's a number of guys that have come through the doors with a lot of things that they're carrying with them. Lord, may those things all be left tonight right there at the foot of the cross. And, Lord, may they take upon themselves your yoke that is easy and your burden that is light and lord may each one be refreshed in the spirit tonight we pray in jesus name amen peter an apostle of jesus christ now peter of course wasn't always an apostle and most of you guys are probably fairly familiar with Peter and his background, but let me just remind you of a couple of things. Uh, Peter was a fisherman by trade, and, you know, he really seems to be kind of a, a rough and tumble kind of a guy, um, you know, just sort of a classic blue-collar type of a guy. That, that's how Peter strikes me. You know, when I, when I read his epistles and when I read about his... Um, experiences in the gospel there, you know, with Jesus and alongside the other apostles. He, he just strikes me in that way, where Paul, uh, on the other hand, you know, strikes me a little bit differently. When I read Paul, when I think about Paul, he was certainly, you know, in many ways, uh, a rugged kind of a guy, and he was, you know, sort of an unstoppable type of a personality. But, you know, he was much more uh, the scholar. He was much more of, a, of an academic in many ways than was Peter. Um, Peter was just, you know, he was just kind of a hard-working guy, but he knew the Lord and he knew the Word of God. And in, in this epistle here, we see one of the things that I, I think is encouraging is to see how Christ has so radically transformed this man. Now, this... This epistle was written many years after um, the historical accounts that we have in the Gospels. And in the Gospels and even in the early history of the church, you find that, uh, you know, Peter had a lot of rough edges. And, you know, many times he was guilty of blurting out the wrong thing or having, you know, the wrong perspective on things. And um, at times he was... Uh, prideful, and uh, at times he was uh, fearful, and uh, to the point of cowardice at times. Um, it, you know, just just a, a real, you know a real guy uh, with all of 
the complexities and all of the, you know, inconsistencies and things that just seem to kind of go along with, with who we are as people. But when you get to these epistles, again, many years down the road, you, you, you start to see just the, the impact of the grace of God upon his life, and you see that there's a real refining that's taken place. You see that there's an incredible uh, maturity that's developed in his life, and, you know, basically you just can sort of get a picture from the Gospels and Acts and then into these epistles, you get a picture of somebody growing in the Lord. And that's what we're all doing. We're all growing in the Lord. And, uh, you know, sometimes if you don't grow up with a real biblically based Christian faith, you get a lot of ideas about things that aren't, you know, actually the case. And, and one of the things I think that most people uh, get, which is a totally wrong idea, but most people get the impression that the people we read about in the Bible, like the apostles or the prophets or the patriarchs or whoever it might be, we, we get this false impression that they were perfect people, that they were, you know, um, extraordinarily holy, that they were so much different than we are. And, of course, we figure, you know, we could never be like them. But the beautiful thing is when you start studying the scriptures, you start to find out, oh, these guys were just like us. We are just like them. We're all made of the same stuff, sinful human flesh. And it's God's grace being poured out upon us and God's mercy and his love and his patience and all of those things that work throughout a process of time and throughout the circumstances of life to refine us and to make us more and more into the image of Christ. And that comes through in this epistle from Peter. You see a man who's been uh, chiseled by the grace of God, and he's just so full of grace himself, and he's so full of wisdom, and he's so full of faith, and, and all of those things that we want to grow up into as we grow in the Lord. So, but now he's an apostle. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he's writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. The pilgrims of the dispersion, um, you know, just a little bit of a technicality. Some people say, oh, you know, Peter's writing, obviously, to Jews because he uses this word dispersion or diaspora, uh, which was a way of referring to the Jews that were scattered among the Gentiles. Um, I personally think that he's talking about not necessarily just the Jew, Jewish believers, but I think he's just talking about all of the believers who are uh, dispersed throughout all of these different nations. I don't think, as some commentators would insist, that First Peter is um, essentially a, a Jewish Christian epistle. Um, I think it's just a general Christian epistle. Uh, Hebrews. Hebrews, of course, is primarily a Jewish Christian epistle. It certainly has application to us as well, but it was written to uh, the Jewish believers. I think Peter um, had a more general audience. So he says, speaking of these, these pilgrims who are dispersed throughout uh, these various regions, and we are part of that, and of course we're much further down uh, the road in history, but we're still part of the body of Christ that is uh, dispersed all around the world today. So he says that we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And this is the same kind of thing that is stated in many different ways throughout the epistles, um, even uh, the Gospels, of course, you remember Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And so election and being chosen are synonymous. So we, are, we have been chosen. Uh, we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So God knowing all things from the very beginning. He knows everything that's ever going to transpire in, in all of history and he knows 
those that are going to respond to his gracious invitation to be saved. And knowing those that are going to respond to his gracious invitation to be saved, he then uh, makes special plans for them. He predestines them, as Paul says in Romans 8, uh, to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, it's not that uh, there are certain people that God uh, just arbitrarily said, well, I'm not choosing them. The fact of the matter is uh, Christ died for everyone. And as Jesus said, many are called, meaning everybody has the same opportunity to be saved. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Why are only a few chosen? Only a few are chosen because only a few respond to the call. So God's not going to force anybody into a relationship with him. God's not going to force people to uh, submit to him in the sense that they're going to have to love him and obey him and spend eternity with him. God certainly invites us to do that. He absolutely wants us to do that, but he's going to let us make the decision as to whether we're going to do it. And when we make the decision, he then predestines us. But of course, that's the practical side of it. He already predestined us before uh, the world was ever formed because he knew from before time uh, those who would respond. So he then chose them or elected them. So elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit. And then for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You see right here in this second verse, you see all three persons of the Trinity at work in saving us. God chooses us, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us, and Christ, of course, through his blood, cleanses us. But sanctification in the spirit. Sanctification is a word that means basically separation from, or it implies separation from sin and separation to uh, the glory of God, or the purposes of God. So, The Spirit is the one who is sanctifying us. The Spirit is separating us from sin. As, as we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. And the Spirit begins to work to sanctify us, to set us apart from sin, and to lead us and direct us in the path that God has for our lives. But it's a work of the Spirit. Now, it's, sanctification is a cooperative thing. Salvation is, you know, in, if you look at salvation, you can look at it from three different perspectives. You can look at it uh, from the perspective of the past, the present, and the future. Now, when we think of salvation in the past tense, we call that justification. Justification means that we've been declared righteous. And so this is this, so we say we're saved. I'm saved. And when I say I'm saved, what I'm really talking about is I'm justified. I've been declared righteous by God. But there's also this present activity that is also referred to as being saved, but it's it's a process, and this is the sanctification process. So I've been declared righteous, but I'm in the process of being set apart from sin and set apart for God. So you've got justification, sanctification, and then thirdly, you have glorification, and that's what's going to happen in the future. The sanctification process will come to a conclusion, and we will be in the presence of the Lord, and we will be glorified. So when the Bible says we're saved, sometimes it speaks of being saved in the past tense, sometimes it speaks of it in the present tense, and sometimes he speaks of salvation in the future tense. But if you're really saved, all three of them are true uh, of you presently. You have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. You can't, you know, divide salvation up and, 
well, that group over there, they're justified, but they're not sanctified. This group is sanctified, but they're not justified. These guys are going to be glorified, but they were never sanctified or justified. You can't divide it up like that. It's all one thing. And so it's the work of the Spirit, but as I was saying, it's, uh, it's a cooperative effort this is here. So it's the Holy Spirit moving us, and, and yet we have to comply with the Spirit. We have to go with His uh, instruction. We have to go with His conviction. We have to go with His leading, and as we respond and cooperate, that sanctification process is being you know, further carried out in our lives. And then for obedience. So sanctified of the Spirit for obedience. And this is what God is wanting to work in us. He's wanting to work in us obedience. Obedience to His Word, obedience to the prompting of, of His Spirit, obedience to His call upon our lives, uh, to obey God is really, in some ways, it's kind of the essence of our uh, relationship with him. And God not only requires that we obey him, but he delights in obedience and he blesses obedience. Maybe you remember that story back in uh, the book of 1 Samuel where Saul was, you know, he'd been chosen by God. He had been given tremendous privileges, made the the first king over Israel. Uh, but Saul was, he was a self-willed man and he was constantly rebelling against God, not in the major areas necessarily, but just in small things that God was speaking to him about. He just would kind of do his own thing. And there came a point where God had declared to Saul that he was to carry out a certain task and Saul didn't complete the task. He did what he thought was adequate, but he, you know, just sort of felt like, well, you know, I've, I've done a good enough job. But he didn't do what God had really called him to do. And to make up for it, he offered some sacrifices. And so the prophet Samuel comes to Saul at a certain point, and he says to him, he says, why have you disobeyed the voice of the Lord? And, and Saul says, what? No, I, I did what the Lord told me, and look at all of Look at all I've got for sacrifice. And Samuel said these classic words. He said, to obey is better than to sacrifice. See, a lot of times people substitute sacrifice for obedience. They say, oh, well, you know, hey, I, I went to church, uh, you know, every Sunday last month. Or, um, man, I, you know, I've given a big offering, you know, this past month. And they're, they're looking at that. Uh, or, you know, you know I've, I've given up my time. I've made some sacrifices. They're looking at that as a substitute for obedience. And God says, no, to obey is better than to sacrifice. God would say, leave your sacrifices. You keep those. You obey me. That's what he wants. And so the Spirit's work, the sanctification thing that we're talking about, is really bringing us into a, uh, an obedient walk with the Lord. That we're obeying him. And like I said, when we obey God, we put ourselves in the place of blessing. And of course, this is a message that the Lord has given to his people throughout all of the ages. When Israel is going to go in to inherit the land, God says, okay, I want you to take uh, a group and I want you to stand on this mountain and another group on this mountain. And these guys are going to pronounce a curse and these guys are going to pronounce a blessing. And basically, the curse is on all disobedience and the blessing is on all obedience. Just to remind them that obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings a curse. Jesus said, you remember, if you love me, keep my commandments, keep my words. He that does not love me does not keep my word. You know, there's a lot of lip service that people give to the Lord, isn't there? Oh, I love the Lord. I've had so many people, you know, tell me how much they love God while at the very same instance they're justifying their disobedience to God. You see, Jesus would say, no, he that loves me obeys me. So if we're, you know, we've got this big profession to love the Lord, but we're not walking in obedience, there's 
a contradiction there because that work of the Spirit is for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood.